So first things first, I want you to take us through the first moment you knew you were onto something with Bleacher Report. Uh yeah, so we I started Bleacher Report uh, in 2005, and uh, it started as a project with a couple buddies of mine. We were sports fans. We read everything we could online about our teams, and we watched ESPN our whole lives growing up, and we just felt that we could do something better, that we could put something out there uh, that – that didn't exist that, that spoke to, to young, uh, obsessed fans like us. And the, the initial idea was, Hey, we love sports and we're going to just start our own sports site and we'll start blogging and writing about it. And then we, we kind of tweaked that idea to think about it as a place where any obsessed fan could come and have their voice heard. And that was, that was the first version of Bleacher Report. It was a platform by fans for fans. And that was a big leap. But the, the, the part that really got me thinking that it could be something was when we started having all sorts of people from all over the country, all over the world, starting to come to Beach Bleacher Report and write about sports and, and be a part of the community. And, it, it was, yeah, you know, we, this was the vision, but we didn't know if it would actually happen. Uh, and we did all sorts of uh, interesting things at the time to, to get the word out, but actually seeing people come and join and who we never knew, we, we've never heard of before, join in, start to share things and start to publish, seeing interesting things uh, was pretty eye opening uh, and really got me thinking that this could turn into something. Was there a specific moment though in all that where you're like, Oh my God, this is crazy. Like I never envisioned this happening. It was, it was gradual. It was gradual. Yeah. It, it was one of those things where you start out with a certain idea of how something can go. And we thought it was, our vision was pretty big and we got to that point And then we said, Oh no, we can make this even bigger. And, and we kept just pushing the goalposts out of what, what it could be. Uh, I remember the first time I saw just someone reading Bleacher Report on their phone, or I think it was on a laptop. I was on a, I was on a plane, and someone was sitting in a row in front of me or something like that, and I saw, saw them typing. Maybe they had their email up, and then they opened up another tab, and they had Bleacher Report. And that was that was another thing. It was like, wow, there's I mean, we had millions of people reading the site at the time, but but still, you you just see see it randomly out there, and and that was a whole different thing. Uh, so th there were all sorts of moments like this along the way, and uh, yeah, that there's another aspect to it of that gradual uh, approach. Is a lot of people when Bleacher finally like really blew up would say things like, oh, Bleacher, you came out of nowhere. It's overnight <laughs> success. And we were building on it for years and years, a lot of those times in obscurity. But we were seeing these moments of potential and and just building that belief that eventually it would blow up. So every overnight success has that long backstory of the, the years of effort that it takes to get to that point. Yeah, I love your tweet, which was about – Year one, zero dollars in revenue. Year two, eighty thousand. Year three, nine hundred thousand. Year four, four point eight million. Year five, fourteen million. Year six, thirty one million. And it just goes to show, like, the thirty one million might just come overnight to some people's eyes, but the zero to thirty one was a journey, and I think that gets lost a lot of the times. Oh yeah, oh yeah. A lot of a lot of work, a lot of experimentation, a lot of wrong moves. And it could have gone could have gone differently. Luck luck always plays a role. It's 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 one part luck, it's one part effort, it's 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 one part vision and strategy and, and you have to have it's it's a big part of it's the team. You have to have all these things playing together uh, to to have a shot. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so I'm curious today, we sit in twenty twenty. We 
this to me is the first time you are are sharing yourself on the internet this past, I don't know, three, four, five months, six months as a personal brand. I'm curious why you you haven't why you didn't make that leap before 2020. That's a great question. That's a great question. And and there's there are a few reasons. And hopefully this will be instructive uh, to other people who are in a similar position. I I will say uh, a big part of it was insecurity. And even even after having built Bleacher and having done other things in the media, I I had this hang up that, oh, you know, I'm going to let the work speak for itself. I'm not going to put myself out there front and center uh, and and just keep my head down. And I think a lot of people, uh, you know, might feel that way or, you know, one of the things I used to tell uh, myself or, or when I thought about this is, Oh, I'm, I'm a private person. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, go out there and, and talk myself up or, or you know, brag or whatever. And I, I through a few different things, I, I, I kind of got over that or I just decided it's there. Everyone feels insecurities or feels, uh, maybe hesitant to speak up at certain points. Uh, but I, I let myself, just push through it and get over it, uh, which has been really gratifying. It's 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 been great to tell my story from my point of view. I've been been behind so many other media brands, where working with so many other great storytellers, uh, and it's been uh, it's been fun to get in that creator seat and and see what it's like, uh, and and also to meet a lot of really interesting people like you and and a lot of other people I've met via Twitter, via my blog. Uh, I, another part besides the insecurity was boredom. Uh, during the the very, uh, you know, most, uh, you know, uh, quiet moments of the quarantine uh, during, during the spring, I was in New York, everything was closed, everything was dead. I was, I was holed up in my, in my, my townhouse with my family and had a little bit more time on my hands and decided I'd uh, I'd give it a shot to to be a little bit more public and if I couldn't meet people out in the world uh, engage on Twitter engage more online and and see what would happen. What have been some of the biggest benefits you've noticed from sharing your story online so far? I, I love the feedback I get. I've met I met some really interesting uh, entrepreneurs who are working through similar issues, similar problems, who have questions related to things that I'm talking about. Uh, I've always worked with other founders and entrepreneurs and either in my peer group, just comparing notes or as an advisor or mentor. Uh, so it's, it's opened up some new relationships or, you know, rekindled some others, some people that I, you know, haven't talked to in a while, uh, have reconnected with. Uh, and it's, it's, super helpful for my own thinking just to be able to work through to tell some of the stories that I've been through in the past and think about oh yeah that's these are some of the real reasons why this thing worked with bleacher or why I made this decision with inverse uh and I I'm at some point gonna launch some new projects or jump into something new so as I start to think about that and explore those it's it's really uh helpful I'm sure you found as well writing is the most helpful way to work through your thinking and and really examine it uh, in a more intentional way. No doubt about it. It's so interesting because you think you know something and then you write it down and you're like, I don't, I didn't know anything at all. Like, I, I need to rethink my my thinking on this. So in in that way, writing is meditation, and it it brings me up to another point. Another tweet that you had that I wanted to bring up, which was you said that the the keys to mental and physical wealth or wellness rather are seven to eight hours of sleep, drinking plenty of water, avoiding processed foods, taking long walks, listening to the Grateful Dead and meditating. And that was out of order. But I wanted to ask, what does your current meditation practice look like? If you, uh, if at well, all. Uh, so I... I meditate almost every day uh my my typical practice is first thing in the morning uh try to do it as soon as i can after i get up 
uh, you know, before I do anything else, just to make sure I, I do it and I start the day out on a good note with a good intention. Uh, I use uh, I use Waking Up, uh, the app uh, that Sam Harris uh, uh, runs and 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 puts together. And I've tried I've tried a few of the others, but that one just just works for me. He's got great. 10, 20 minute, uh, meditation, daily meditations in there. Plus a lot of other interesting programming that you can kind of dip in and out of. So I, I try to do it first thing in the morning, wherever I am, if I, if I sit on the floor, if I wake up early for whatever reason, I'm just go out in a dark room and do it. If I'm, if the weather's nice, I go, go do it outside and, and really just try to start the day with that intention, that, that clear head, that, that focus on the present moment. Uh, and, and I notice the difference right away. And then I make sure to supplement that with listening to a lot of the grateful dead, which keeps that, uh, keeps that, uh, that focus going throughout the day. How, how long have you been meditating and what was the initial change and initial jump to make you go ahead and do that? So, uh, for, I'd say like two, three years now, and I had tried it off and on before. Uh, I even going back to you know, when I was in college, I I went to there was like a a Buddhism meditation club that I went to a couple times, but I ne- it never really stuck with me. Uh, and even when in the last few years, as meditation has become more mainstream, it was one of those things that oh, I should really try that, but I never quite quite did it, and uh, a few years ago, uh, I was I was in a in a peer kind of mentorship group, like a peer CEO group for other startup founders, and we were talking about some every every month you would meet to talk about issues going on and get feedback from from peers, and it was, it was super helpful. I was running uh, Inverse on the time at the time as a startup. Uh, as always, things were very chaotic and stressful. And I think we were talking about one of uh, the other uh, members of the group, uh, something they were dealing with and their stresses. And someone just suggested, have you tried meditating? That could help. And uh, they kind of laughed it off at the time. And they're like, oh, no, I need a, I need a more serious solution to this problem. And for whatever reason, that that suggestion stuck with me, and I was like, "Hey, I'm dealing with a lot of stress right now. I'm just going to give this a shot." Uh, and so I started. I went through waking up uh, when I started using it. had had like a 50 day intro course where everything kind of built on on it on it, and that really helped to develop the habit. Uh, and it's it's just something I've, I've stuck with ever since. Yeah, it's so incredible when it's. I feel like by doing this podcast and talking to you, as many people as I've talked to, I can just tell within the first five minutes whether someone has spent any time meditating. I don't know what it is. It's just like a presence about them, a lack of care about being anywhere else. And obviously, it's not a solution to all your problems, but there's really just a presentness that I've noticed in people who meditate that I noticed in yourself. So yeah, it's awesome that you've been doing that and it definitely shows. Yeah. No, thanks. How, what about you? What's what's your uh, your history with meditation? I just started last year, and I hated doing it. Twenty minutes a day in the morning, no apps, and I just did it because a friend did it, and I was like, "Oh, it works for him. I I got to do it." And I stuck with it for for three months, and then I was like, "Oh my god, this is life changing." So here we are today. But um, awesome. yeah, it's uh. It's a life-changing habit for anyone listening, and I highly recommend it. Moving on, though, I want to talk to you about content because you are you have spent so much of your life, practically as long as I've lived, thinking about content on the internet, which is pretty absurd. 15 years going back to the Bleacher Report days is like, it's crazy. So my question to you is, if you were starting a Bleacher Report today or starting a personal brand today, what type of content would you prioritize? Where would it be? What type of, of things would you be focused on? I'm curious about your answer to this. Yeah, yeah. It's, the space is it's fascinating. It's so uh, 
Uh, I, I love being in the space. Uh, there's some brilliant people working in it. It's, it's challenging. There's so many ebbs and flows that, you know, a couple of years ago, people were writing off a lot about the media space in certain ways. And for good reason, there were a lot of challenges. There still are. And, uh, and yet now there's also this resurgence of new types of creators. There was, First podcasts were out of control. They still are now. Newsletters and email is is all the rage, and and a lot of these things are that have been around for a while are getting reinvigorated and 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 rediscovered, uh, and new things are being created. Uh, the the sp- I'm I'm a big fan of the email newsletter space. I I always have been, uh, and I I love seeing it it be so uh invigorated right now uh it's it's a little crazy uh you know how how many newsletters there are out there but i think within good reason it's it's a great medium and i think if i was starting something new today certainly would i think newsletters would be a big component i'm a really big believer in Niche media, uh, which is also uh, getting a lot of attention right now, uh, and especially when you compare that with community, I think a newsletter with a niche community, niche focus, a niche community where you can add value uh, to an audience and to their lives and help them connect with content that either improves their lives or serves a passion of theirs, uh, as well as connect them with like-minded people. If you, if you find something in that space, there's a lot of potential. Uh, so that's, that's, those are some of the spaces I'm looking at. Uh, B2B media has a, a, a lot, also has gotten a, kind of a resurgence of interest, even though it's been around forever. And there are a lot of p- operators in that space who've been killing it for a while. Uh, but it's kind of one of those things that all of a sudden people are rediscovering. Uh, I'm a big fan of B2B, B2B media. I don't know if that's the space for me. I've always been a little bit more consumer minded. Uh, but uh, it's definitely one that uh, that certainly has a lot of potential right now. When you look at niche audiences, I was shocked by doing research for this conversation that there's an Elon Musk newsletter that has 60,000 subscribers. Like, this is so crazy to me. And it got me thinking, like, who's going to create the Joe Rogan newsletter? Who's going to create the Gary Vaynerchuk newsletter? Like, there's niches within people that we don't normally think of as niches, and it, it just got me thinking when, when you brought that up in a, in a different conversation. So what other opportunities are there like that where people could grab onto that and, and take that if, if uh, they're, they're thinking along those lines? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's the, the old uh, adage about media is all about bundling then unbundling then rebundling and we're, we're maybe that's constantly happening but we're definitely in a phase right now where there's a lot of unbundling happen, happening and there's probably some bundling happening happening too w- one of the big opportunities is is unbundling reddit and mm. looking at subreddits that have huge interest huge community and thinking about how could that exist as its own media brand slash community. Uh, so, and th- that was, uh, that was a little bit of some of the idea behind, uh, uh, inverse. And we looked at the futurology, uh, subreddit, uh, which, uh, which has a, a great community and thought, Hey, what if there was a, a media brand, which, which really served that community very well? Uh, we went a little more broad than that uh, at the end of the day, but definitely have a, a core of inverse, uh, which focuses around that futurology type topic. But you can, you mentioned some personalities, Gary V, Joe Rogan. They obviously have huge followings. You could build something around them or you could build something around the idea of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the psychographic of the person who is a big fan of them whether it's it's uh, it's kind of the 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 biohacker aspect that Joe Rogan really really digs into, or kind of the the, the hustle culture side of uh, of Gary V. So there's, I think, you can look at Reddit, you can look at 
who's big on social platforms, who's you know who has a, who's has a big podcast, and find these niche audiences that clearly have a passion and and just align that with with something that you're interested in to build something around. When building Inverse, did you were the tactics then to write the article on Inverse and then post it on the Futurology Reddit? What was where did you go thinking about building that traffic source? So we didn't so much look to to post it and and Reddit. Uh, yeah, Reddit is so community driven. You you really want that to happen organically. So we look more looked at hey, what are the what are the topics that that the bit, the members of the community the 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 moderators who have a lot of influence what are the ones that they're really interested in what are the the stories that tend to really go off uh the elon musk clearly is is one uh, you know almost anything he touches uh you know gets gets a lot of traction there but there's some interesting you know when when you talk about things like developing fusion technology or these these moonshot type type projects uh, anytime there's a development in those, the, those get a ton of interest on those communities. So we, we really looked, looked to the, the community to mine it for insights and ideas about where we should cover and then built through our own editorial efforts a lot of expertise and authority around those topics. And then the, the shares started to happen organically from there. How many different newsletters do you guys currently have at Inverse? So we've recently made a few changes. I, I think we have we have four now. Uh, so we have Inverse Daily, uh, which is our daily flagship uh, that goes out to a few hundred thousand people and, and covers the big stories with a that we cover with a, a slant towards science and technology. Uh, we have Musk Reads, uh, which is which is our our Elon focused newsletter. It's run by a, a brilliant journalist named Mike Brown, who's based in the UK, uh, and covers Tesla, SpaceX, boring company, Neuralink, Elon's crazy tweets, uh, <laughs> you know, him moving to Texas, anything else, uh, but really with more focus on the the substance of what he's doing. Uh, and we just launched a premium version of that. So we just launched uh, Musk Reads Plus, uh, which is a, a paid premium tier that includes a lot of exclusive content and interviews that we're releasing. Uh, and then we have uh, we have Multiverse, uh, which is more of our entertainment, sci-fi, comic book, uh, focus, culture-focused uh, newsletter. So you get reviews on new sci-fi shows streaming on Netflix or new Marvel or DC movies or things like that. Uh, and then we have strategy, which is, which is aimed at, at more of a, a business audience, but it's really driven by behavioral psychology and, and kind of the science of business and how you think about, uh, you leveraging science to get ahead in your career or help you with, uh, with, uh, recruiting or, collaboration in the workplace, things like that. How do you think about premium content in general? Because when I think about it, I think, oh, you know, I don't want to give, I don't want to hide some of my best work to, to more people. But at the same time, I understand there's a need when you're producing media, producing content to get paid for it. So how do you, how do you think about that, that discrepancy? So this is Musk Reads Plus is our first experiment with any kind of paid or premium content, uh, and so we're we're learning right now too, uh, and that's that's part of the interesting part. I love seeing people experiment with business models and media, and to understand it, I, I decided we had to do it ourselves uh, to really get under the hood. I agree, you, you don't want to hide your best stuff behind a paywall. Uh, and you want people to be able to, to discover it. Uh, and you, you, you want to, if you do great work, you want it to get it out there. You want as many people to read it as possible. I think there, there are ways to provide enough value to an audience to make them very comfortable with pain and to provide those exclusive pieces 
while still leveraging the work that you're doing to a greater audience. So we, you know, for, for this, uh, this newsletter, we may do an in-depth interview with a early engineer at SpaceX or or something like that and, Mm -hmm. and get a lot of insights into how they thought about some of the projects that they worked on. And we may take the best nuggets of that and release those in the, in the free version of the newsletter, put them out as articles on inverse, try to get as much mileage of that from that as possible and reserve the full in-depth interview. Maybe, maybe it lasted a couple hours and goes very long for the premium subscribers who just want everything. So I think there, there, there are ways to do that where you're, you're getting the most value from the, the, the juiciest pieces mm-hmm. while still giving the hardcore audience the way to go deeper. Mm. One of the things you've probably spent a lot of time thinking about is community. And you, you've said before that you're surprised that subscriptions like the New York Times and the Washington Post aren't focused on building community. How would you go about building a community for a New York Times or a Washington Post? Yeah, it's 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 a challenging problem, and I I understand what what might give them hangups from doing it. And uh, Jacob Donnelly uh, from the a media operator newsletter and, and Morning Brew, uh, who's who's a great uh, read and subscribe if you aren't already following him for for all things media. He he did a did a really good analysis about how how hard it is to build community at scale. When you're when you're a massive property like the New York Times or the Washington Post with over a hundred million people visiting you, if you try to just throw all those people into a community, you're you're primed for chaos. Uh, so I think it's about where you find the the niches inside that community. Uh, I mentioned uh, when I talked about that New York Times cooking, uh, which is already their it's already kind of a community. The comments there are super valuable. Uh, I, when I am, am doing cooking at home, it's, it's often one of my go-tos to find recipes. And I look at the recipe, but I also look at the, the top comments because people will give, oh, this is how I tweaked it. Or you might want to watch out for this. Or if you don't have this ingredient, here's some good substitutes. So they're really value add. And I think there's maybe something beyond that where you could – take that that nascent community bubbling up in the comments and give them more ways to engage with each other, give them more ways to to contribute their own recipes, give them yeah, create create more of a of a feedback loop mm-hmm. uh, that can can add more value. And the New York Times kind of tried to do that with their parenting section and then decided to to end the experiment. Uh, but it feels like cooking's the right way to go. Uh, and I, if I was in the, in that in that position, I would look at potentially some other verticals. See, there's some really good parenting content, or not parenting. Um, there's some really good uh, kind of work life balance content on uh, on New York Times that that could be another interesting approach. Washington Post, it's a little bit more broad newsy, but they may have so within that they may have some verticals that they see this this potential that. Uh, yeah, there's an interesting comment on that when I when I shared that thought uh, from Mike Kearns uh, at uh, the Chernin Group that Food 52, uh, which they uh, are big investors in and uh, and has been really successful, was started by some ex New York Times food journalists who wanted to build something that was more community oriented uh, and and built that up over a number of years. So it it kind of shows that this potential is there uh, and maybe they failed to capture it with the food 52 example, but they could still do it internally with the right approach. What does that look like? Is it just creating a forum for people or is it getting everyone into a huge like chat room? Like what, what does the actual community building look like? So you could, you could do something like a forum. I, I tend to think you want more, especially for something like the New York times or uh, something where there's already a critical mass of people, you, you want more structure to it 
mm-hmm. uh, and you want more moderation. So perhaps it's or it's something along the lines of you anyone like you can now can comment on on recipes and comment on pieces, and you give people the ability to rate and give feedback on the comments and people who have the highest value comments then have the ability to share recipes and people can can rate and review those and there's there's some there's some feedback or communication with the staff so i i I think it has to be the community has to be built to serve the the product itself you can't just bolt on community features and say all right we got a community we threw up a (laughs) forum and people can chat and post with each other and we've got a community uh i think you, you need to build build a system to serve ultimately what what's going to be most valuable to the community and be most value to the me- valuable to the media property do you think there's any possibility for someone like a, a chef to come in and partner with the new york times there and offer some sort of community where you could ask the chef questions directly or, or something along those lines where you have an influencer of some sort or, or a celebrity teaming up with a media organization to create this community that would have been bigger than if one of them just did it on their own? Do you think that's possible? Potentially, for sure. The New York Times has been investing a ton in talent, uh, primarily journalistic talent. I don't know that they've done anything with more on the influencer or, or celeb side, uh, yeah. but... I wouldn't put it past them, uh, and you, you just look at what some of these uh, some of these YouTube and Instagram chefs have done, building brands for themselves and and building huge followings and and really using the tools of those platforms to create communities around their work. Uh, there there is uh, there there's definitely an opportunity there. Mm-hmm. One thing that you've spoken a lot about is cold emailing. And you had this tweet when you were 22 years old, founding Bleacher Report, you cold emailed a bunch of people and most ignored, but some replied and and many you're still close with today. So I'm curious, what do you think makes a good cold email? I think get right to the point. Uh, Everyone has a tendency to want to tell their life story uh, uh, to, to build up to whatever they want to say. But I think Get it right out there. Demonstrate value, even if even if you're brand new and you haven't done anything. That you can you can share something that shows that you're bringing value to the table. That you're not just asking, uh, and then get right to the ask. Uh, and for me, when I was starting Bleacher Report, it was, hey, I, I'm a first time entrepreneur. I, I built started this sports site. Here's what we've done. Would love to ask you about this or chat about something specific. I think that's the other thing. Uh, you know, busy people, uh, successful people, they don't have a lot of time, but they really appreciate very specific asks. And I always, I, I don't, I'm not able to respond to all of them, but I, <laughs> I read all the inbound stuff I get, whether it's email, whether it's Twitter DMs and try to respond to as many as possible. Uh, and, it always helps me because I want to, I want to hear what new people are doing or what people I haven't heard about are doing. And it's, it's interesting to me. It's an opportunity to learn. Uh, I'm curious in that way. And I think most people are too. And I think that's what drives a lot of successful people is to stay curious and not get, get comfortable or get left behind. Uh, so if you are new to what you're doing, if you're looking to level up, if you're looking to get in touch with, with someone uh, that you look up to, use that to your advantage and and share something cool that you're working on or some insight that you have or something that you've published uh, on Twitter or on your site uh, that's going to be relevant and then get to the point around an ask because that's the other, when I do get something and it's, it's just a general, hey, I want to pick your brain or would love to chat sometime about something very broad, it's, it's hard to get geared up to do that or it's a, it's it's just it's much easier to say i i don't know if i have time for this or i don't know what this is really about versus if someone's got something very specific that they either want to tell me about or they want to ask about then it's it makes it that much easier you got to tee it up for someone uh so that's that's uh i mean something that i try to 
pay it forward by by still uh, getting back to people and engaging people to this day. And I'm still cold emailing people. You know, it's it's you just got to put yourself out there if, if you're trying to to start a conversation. I think that so often when you're in that position of you know being that first time entrepreneur, you have the tendency to believe that other people are are too busy or they'll never respond to you. But like you said, it's like, yes, most won't respond. But the point is that the f- there are people who are curious about people coming up. And what I found very interestingly when reaching out for this podcast is that some of the most successful people in the world respond to their email in five minutes. And I'll be like, yeah. how is that possible? Right? They're like, yep. <laughs> And so it it's like you never know until you ask. And and yeah. I always tell the advice, like, reach out to one person who you look up to every day. And if you do that for a year, you're going to be in a much better place than you were the year before. You build a hell of a network. You will. And, you know, I, I always think about the stories that used to come out with back when Steve Jobs was still alive, where the a new iPhone would come out and there'd be a bug or an issue with it. And people would email him and he'd send off one line replies with, with uh, either – he'd say thanks for the feedback or he'd, he'd kind of, you know, push back on them and say, it's, it's supposed to work that way. And if, if Steve jobs had time to, to respond to, to people's uh, customer support emails, then you got to think that, that other busy people are, 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 are willing to, to read and, and respond. On the topic of Steve jobs, I saw today a video of Steve jobs in 2007 scrolling from, for the iPhone with the crowd in the background and them losing their minds that, the the screen scrolled like I thought it was just hilarious you know and, and it just goes to show how far technology has come on that topic how far have you seen media come in the last 15 years what are some of the things in media today that you either can't believe that it's so advanced or so antiquated that it still is the same way that it was 15 years ago yeah media like I was saying before it's very cyclical very up and down a lot of things go away and then they come back and and there are many models in media that just they just work you look at their the the vert- the interest verticals sports is a big interest vertical and it pretty much always will be whether it's going back to the sporting news 100 years ago then sports illustrated then espn then bleacher report then barstool then whatever's going to come next and it's just all about remixing the form and the format and that's always changing. And sometimes that goes away and comes back just the way the newsletters have. I think the most interesting thing uh, for me right now is the, the rise of the individual creator and just the tools available to them. People like yourself who are, are building personal media empires. Uh, and that's also something that's been around. It's not like this has never happened before uh, yeah, an example I always throw out there is Martha Stewart, who you built a personal media empire around herself, uh, you know, a couple decades ago and it's still going strong today. And her company grew and went public and all, all these great things, but it's, it's definitely, it's happening at a faster rate today. And I think the tools are there and the tool, some of the tools have been around for a while too, like blogs and social media is not exactly brand new, but I think the combination of the tools, the way people are using them, and I think also the monetization, which is really the missing piece. There are ways now that that you can make money as an individual creator without selling your soul, uh, without being completely dependent on advertising, which advertising isn't – I don't think it's evil. I don't think it's bad. I've, most of the business I've been involved with have made most of their money off of advertising, but it's not for everyone, and there are creators now who are – monetizing via subscription they're monetizing via commerce they're monetizing via building communities and there's so many other ways that they can build businesses that are either monetizing their audience directly or they're more uh they're more organic uh and they give the creator more control uh so i think that's that's a trend that that i'm super interested in and i think that's that is changing things and i think the question is well where does it go next do you see, again, to that bundling, unbundling question, do you see creators start to bundle themselves together into media companies, kind of the way you see like TikTok houses and stuff like that? Those are, I guess, a form of a bundle. 
Uh, do you see, um, you know, media companies investing more in creators? Uh, that's that's something my friend Jared Dicker has been talking a lot about. The media company is the the record label where it's more about you know empowering the creator and kind of letting them do their thing and and uh, just providing kind of the underlying resources for them to create a little bit what Substack does by bringing all these people on and kind of giving them the tools and a little bit of support, but really putting the, the creators front and center. So I'm, I'm fascinated by that whole development. And I think it is, it does have the potential to be uh, a, a huge inflection point in, in media over the next 10 years. So you have all these individual creators trying to basically become media companies and where do you think this goes? You know, you mentioned unbundling and bundling, but what does this lead to? Where, what is the future for me, Dave? Tell me, tell me, what is my future? 2025, where's Danny Miranda? So, so I think, I think the future, I think the future goes a few ways. You're, you, there's always a power law aspect. You're probably, we're we're going to see some, some creators, maybe, maybe, maybe it's you, Danny, just blow up and, and become, huge become household names become their their own mega brands and they could either do that on their own they could do that as kind of a spin-off brand that they that they do they have uh you know there's gonna be the you know, whoever the next oprah is is gonna come out of this creator class it's it's probably not gonna come out of local access tv the way the way that oprah did uh and that's just the way the world and media works now. So that's going to be fascinating to see how that all plays out. But I think the, the other exciting part of this potential is you don't need to be that huge to have a, a a solid income, to have a platform, to make an impact as a creator. That's what all these tools and all this, this uh, distribution has enabled is you can have a very focused, very niche audience. Uh, you can you can have your 1,000 true fans or even your 100 true fans, and if you're serving them well and you're you're committed to what you're doing, then that can be enough to provide a, a livelihood for you and for you to sustain an audience and 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 sustain a a, a way of life. So that's uh, I think there's there's going to be so many more niche creators out there doing their thing eventually someone may come along and say hey what if we put all these niche creators together and <laughs> bundle them all up and it, it kind of makes me think of the the youtube mcn uh movement which didn't exactly pan out that well uh or never lived really lived up to the promise uh so i'm curious to see what happens you know, when the bundling does start to to come into effect um but uh but yeah i think it's uh there's gonna be there's gonna be opportunities on both ends uh which which makes it very exciting then you'll see people who leverage their creator independence to kind of take a more mainstream approach someone like a, a sarah cooper who goes from going viral on twitter and instagram to having her own, own Netflix show and, and being more in the, the, the kind of mainstream entertainment world. It's so fascinating because what you said about Oprah just rings so true with this is, this is our generation on YouTube, our generation on, on TikTok or whatever these platforms are. That's what Oprah was doing back in the day and fascinating her story. Uh, have you seen the or heard the Acquired FM podcast on her? It's incredible. I, no, I recommend no. it checking out, checking out in media. But yeah, um, so I want to talk to you, switching gears now, about the the cross country trip because I think that is so cool. It's been on my bucket list for a while. I've been been huge on going cross country. I think that I was raised in New York. I lived a little in San Diego. I, I don't really know the country as well as some people, and there's a lot to know. So I'm curious about what your cross-country drive taught you about America. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, I just, uh, whether it was a good or idea or not, uh, I just drove across the country from, from New York to California with, with my family uh, in a minivan. I have two kids, uh, a five-year-old and, a, and almost two years old. And, uh, and my wife and I, uh, we, uh, I, I didn't own a car until six months ago when the pandemic hit. And I, I realized that it wasn't, wasn't so easy to get around New York anymore. So we, we bought a minivan. Uh, which is amazing. I'm, I'm, I am team minivan now for life. Uh, My dad just turned off this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, don't hate, don't hate. Uh, But, uh, but yeah, so we decided, uh, we decided to come out to California for the winter uh, and, and made this whole plan. And this was, this was uh, kind of planned it out before things got crazy again with the pandemic. So, we were a little nervous when we, we, we set sail, so to speak, but uh, the, the trip was amazing. And it was, uh, it was so, uh, so eye-opening and just to, like, felt like just being able to say that you've done it and you've driven across country uh, was an accomplishment in itself. And to, to, uh, to you know, plot out our, our route and, and, see all these places that you would never go to uh, just on their own, but now I might go back. Um, and yeah, hopefully it's something my kids are pretty young. I don't know if they'll remember, but they'll be able to say that they did. Uh, and because of the pandemic, we had to, we had to keep our distance from things. We weren't able to, to mix in with, uh, with, with uh, all the different locations the way we, we would want to normally, but we, we visited, several national parks we we drove through some amazing areas i i I think the most uh the most fascinating part of our trip was driving through we took a a southern route so we drove through west texas and and southern new mexico and arizona and just seeing the landscape there and how it changed just being out in the middle of nowhere uh and seeing how huge this country is uh was incredible uh so it's definitely something i plan to do again hopefully in in better times i want to plan it out so when you're able to i can stop in more places and and see more things and just you know you see you see how people live in different areas you see some things that are very different and you see some things that are the same and there's also just some parts of geography that unless i had sat down and studied a map i never would have realized i remember when we, when we crossed the mississippi river we were not expecting it at all and we we're like holy shit <laughs> we're on the Mississippi River. We just didn't look at the map, and it was it was one of those moments where we're like, "All right, we did it. Cross across the Mississippi." <laughs> what was the most unexpected part of the whole thing? Most unexpected part. Yeah. Well, did you have the, any the major coolest... shifts? Uh, the, well, yeah. I mean, one of the major shifts we we. Um, we ended up so New Mexico was became like a really bad hot spot. I mean, the, it, for COVID while we mm. were while we were on our drive. So we were originally planning to drive through New Mexico and had to stop there. And we just decided better to avoid it and reroute. Um, which I definitely want to go back because it's it's supposed to be a beautiful state. Uh, yeah, we we were we just kind of drove through very quickly. In, no in hard route, feelings, New Mexico. Stop. Exactly, exactly. So we, we routed through and instead of New Mexico, we stopped uh, and stayed uh, for for a night outside of Tucson, Arizona, uh, which which I had never been to before. Uh, and uh, so I made this this playlist for the drive uh, that it's like a 35 hour playlist and <laughs> tried to kind of create it along the way and tried to fill it all with music that either referenced or was written in or by people from the places that we were driving through, uh, which was, was very fun to make. Spotify definitely helped because they're very good with all their recommendations. Once you start to go down the rabbit hole, uh, and I had no idea how many songs referenced Tucson, Arizona. So the, (laughs) the, the Tucson, Arizona playlist section was, was, was very good. Uh, and then we, we went to, uh, 
Saguaro National Forest or National Park right outside of Tucson, which is where they have all these massive cacti, uh, wow. like the classic cacti that like, you know, look like this, you know, with the, the arms up and out for the, the listeners. Uh, but that was just the coolest place. And we drove into the middle of it and we got out with the kids and we hiked around and got all these amazing pictures of cacti and these vistas and plateaus. And, and that was somewhere I never would have gone had we not been on this trip, wasn't even on my radar. And now I'm like, oh, I want to want to go back and, and go see it again at a different time of year or something like that. I'm surprised you haven't started a music blog because you're you're a man of so many different interests. You got the sports, you got the futuristic. Is music your next venture? I it, it could be. I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past. Uh, you know, I've de- I've definitely thought about it, uh, and I've I'm music is is my number one interest and passion right now outside of the the things I do for work and part of me says I want to keep something sacred uh and uh, I will I mean sports has always been a huge passion but definitely working in in the sports industry after a while kind of burned me out on it where Mm. it changed my my relationship with it so I don't I don't want to I don't necessarily want that to happen with with music either uh but i I, I do. I would love to be involved in it in some way beyond my my uh, experience as a fan. What changed when you worked in sports long enough, where you were just like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like a quick story is like Stephen A. Smith was in the was working nonstop, twenty four hours a day during the finals. He was boarding a flight, and a fan walks up to him. And he's like, what do you think of Kobe or whatever? And he's like, dude, I cannot do this anymore. I, and he just, he he was like burned out from sports in that moment. Like you can't talk about it 24-7. Everyone expects you to talk about it all the time. So was it something similar like that to you? Friends coming up to you and stuff like that? Definitely, definitely like that. And I used to be the type of person that no matter what sport was on, what game, it could be my teams, it could be teams I knew nothing about. It could be a sport I wasn't that into. I could sit down and watch it and enjoy it. And I, that was my default at home growing up or you have, you have ESPN on, have sports center on, throw, throw a game on and watch whatever. And that was, that was the experience at, at Bleacher Report, the whole seven plus years that, that I was working there from our tiniest uh most humble office up to when we we built out our our big headquarters was we'd always have flat screens on the wall playing sports no matter what time of day uh while you were working you know following along with what was happening and that was that was the job and in many ways it's a sports fan's dream it's Mm -hmm. it's was one of the things that helped us to recruit such an amazing team and have such great retention is the environment was amazing for a sports fan but over time that being part of the work and part of just constant exposure to it it just got to be too much mm-hmm. and and once once it was finally uh we, we sold the company and and when i when i eventually transitioned out i just needed a break and i, I kind of mm-hmm. got to the point where i was like i don't i don't need to watch another game for a while i don't need to I can I can tune this out, and I got back to the point where I will follow my own teams and, and watch their games, uh, but I'm I'm I just don't need to follow the the constant everyday storylines because similar to the cyclicality of media, everything in sports is cyclical, and you kind of see and we we knew this we could see oh you know this this player's storyline is trending the same way as this other guy's storyline and we would follow it a certain way and you kind of start to see how formulaic it all can become with good reason because that helps you do your job better if you can kind of draw the parallels to the way you've covered something in the past uh but uh it's it's one of those things you start you see how the sausage is made and you start to regard it a little differently yeah makes a lot of sense and it's good i guess that you've come back to your healthy relationship with sports because you probably watched enough sports in, in those years where you're working at Bleacher Report than some people have their whole life. So 
I mean, I, I can understand where you're coming from. Potentially so. Potentially so. <laughs> All right. Before we wrap this thing up, it's been a great conversation. Why don't you give listeners, I like to ask all the guests, what do you, what final pieces of parting wisdom do you have for anyone listening who's trying to improve, whether it be writing, physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever it may be? Do you have any final pieces of parting wisdom for anyone listening? Uh, yeah, I, I would say don't don't be afraid to, to put yourself out there uh, and and you realize you know, we talked earlier about insecurity and the insecurity of uh, using your own voice uh, publicly. And it's, it's something that, that even I dealt with and deal with to this day. And, and I know lots of other people have shared their stories about that. And I think, I think that's as good a lesson as, as any, uh, especially in today's age, because you have the ability to get your voice out there to connect with people the tools, the distribution is there like never before. And whether you want to be build a, a personal media brand, whether you are a, a creator, whether you're a founder or, or looking to start a business that can, can serve you well, or just if you're looking to connect and, and looking to, to be heard, uh, the, the only way that you're going to do it is by, by putting yourself out there and, and, just pushing through those insecurities. So uh, I, I encourage everyone to, to give it a shot. That's great advice. Thank you, Dave. Where can people find you on the internet before we send them off? So, uh, so you can, you can go to Dave Nimitz.com. The, the domain is, is very easy to remember. Uh, and that's where, that's where I have my personal home. Uh, I, I write a weekly essay there. I have a newsletter you can subscribe to, uh, where where you'll get the the essay, or you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Dave Nimitz, uh, and you can get all that stuff there too, uh, along with uh, you know my my general thoughts and and uh, and, and random ideas. Uh, and of course, uh, we would love uh, everyone who hasn't to to go to go to Inverse, uh, go to go to Mike and input uh, some of the other uh, publications uh, I oversee uh, at uh, at BDG. Uh, we have some great uh, great journalists there. Uh, who do an amazing work. Uh, so uh, uh, always got to rep them as well. Awesome. And those links will all be in the show notes at dannymiranda.com slash podcast. Thank you, Dave, for joining us today. It's been a great conversation. Really appreciate you taking the time and have a great one. Yeah, no, thanks, Danny. This was awesome. Really appreciate you bringing me on.